that you'd rather be, man. So on this stage, we have people who are highly educated, who come from Harvard and Yale and all these universities. And we've also got people who are college dropouts. The one thing I love about entrepreneurship is it doesn't discriminate. It is for people who have an eye for opportunity. So it doesn't, it doesn't matter what your background is. And this guy is no different. He's a college dropout. He's never been employed. But catch this. He has founded and grown several tech companies and led two IPOs with multi-billion dollar market caps and one $2.8 billion exit. He's the infamous founder of Demandware, Intershop, and now is on to his third e-commerce venture. Some of you will know it. It's called New Store. Can we put our hands and please welcome Stefan Schambach. Enjoy. Thanks. I thought I provide some lessons learned and practical advice from 20 years of building B2B software companies. And if you still have time, I can tell you a little bit about uh, my new company, New Store. Now, let's start with strategy. What's the reason to build a B2B company? That's really important because you have to be totally passionate about solving an unsolved problem that's worth solving, that's big enough. You have to have a number of industry trends supporting it, growth drivers, two or three, and not just one. Um, for example, when we started Demandware 2004, um, I was convinced that um, e-commerce could be run from within the cloud and that it would provide a much better model for retailers to run their uh, e-commerce websites. At the time, that was unheard of. But um, I clearly saw th that the technology would go in the cloud direction and uh, that uh, retailers had a very notoriously poor and you know, being a software company, they would be much better off consuming this from the cloud. It's difficult to build, but we could eventually convince investors to come in because we could demonstrate that there's a sizable market you know, in excess of uh, 10 billion back in 2004. Nowadays, it's much bigger that we had a unique value proposition with running e-commerce from the cloud, that uh, we could prove it with a first customer, and that um, the technology provided high barriers of entry. And those four things are really important uh, in terms of strategy when you build a uh, B2B software company. Let's talk about validation. Now, one can have a great idea, but you know, how do we get to a point where um, you can um, you know, demonstrate that there's really a business to be have here. The first rule is don't assume inquire. People have great ideas, but unless you pick up the phone and talk to some actual customers or meet with them and re get real insights into what their challenges are, uh, you never really find out uh, you know, what the business opportunity is. It's great to have uh, visual prototypes or a pitch or mock-ups uh, to show before you start investing into uh, uh, software programming, which is very expensive. But, and uh, in the process of showing those mock-ups around, you can get early feedback, incorporate feedback into the next round of uh, mock-ups, and uh, maybe even you know, meet the first prospective customers. That's basically what we did at, uh, you know, uh, Demandware at the time because you couldn't really you know, showcase how it would be if e-commerce would run out of um, the cloud. Um, and at Newstore, at my new company, we are doing the same thing. We work a lot with uh, uh, prototypes, visual prototypes, before we um, write a single line of code. But VCs, venture capitalists, are great for validation because they see a lot of other companies and uh, they can help uh, ask the right questions about your concept. And um, what they most care about is that you have a Product, product market fit or that you can produce a product market fit over time. Now, finding customers, if you do the validation right and you talk to enough VCs and talk to enough prospects, this will provide the first set of two or three customers. Now, it's totally okay if those customers aren't of the size of your ideal customer. That happens to all of us. That was true at InnerShop. That was true at Demandware. And now with Newstore, again, it is true. So our first customer is basically one that's just starting at a fashion brand. But you know, the advantage there is they're very flexible. They're willing to go with another startup versus a very established large company, which may have second thoughts about this. Now, a super important point is the revenue model. 
Um, revenue models used to be license driven. You tried to get um, a contract signed, a CD handed over, and a big check, and then you would run. That is a long time ago. Nowadays, all B2B software license models are in some form or shape subscription models. Um, and in the case of my companies, uh, Demandware, but also for New Store, it's actually a revenue share. So we share in directly into the success um, of our customers by providing them tools that allow them to sell more. Um, it is important to have a growth component in the revenue model. It is not enough to win a customer that then pays a flat fee over a period of, say, you know, five years or for the duration of the contract. It's important to have an uh, embedded growth component. Um, uh, let me talk a little bit about uh, sort of the um, CAC, or the, um, the basically the ratio between customer acquisition cost and customer lifetime value. Um, so um, if you want to have a living with a B2B model, you have to have a 1.3 to 1.10 ratio. 1.3 is the minimum. Um, below that, uh, no VC will fund you. Uh, one, to, 1 to 5 is actually pretty good. Um, and if you can get above that, um, I think you have no, and you can really demonstrate that you have no issue challenge at, uh, funding your business. The disadvantage with those um, subscription uh, or shared success models is that um, their cash flow is problematic. It takes a long time until you have enough customers who have grown enough so that you have a basic uh, revenue line that can feed uh, the company. So it's not uncommon these days that it takes between 60 and 100 million dollars in uh, private funding until the company reaches positive cash flow. Um, so everything you can do to shorten that um, is, uh, you know, paramount that you, you look into this. It's sometimes possible to ask for, say, the first year in advance. May not work out with your first customers, but you know, at demand where that was essential for success. In terms of um, researching financial models of B2B software companies, there is a specialty consulting firm called Opex Engine. They are tracking, since you know, 15 years or so, they've been tracking the uh, finances of privately held and public companies in the software, in the SaaS space in particular, and they have excellent insights. If someone wants to have a look at their website, um, we are using their data a lot. Let's talk about um, the business model in itself a little bit. And obviously, you can earn your money with consulting or implementation services or um, with uh, a product that's providing you sort of a revenue stream on something that's repeatable. Now, um, it is important, obviously, if you want to build a true software company, that you focus on a subscription component. And uh, good businesses today in the cloud space have a uh, service component of not larger than 10%. So you definitely want to have the absolute majority of the revenue coming from the actual product, and that means you have to have a, a sort of an ecosystem of integration partners helping you. Let's talk about sales a little bit. Um, no matter how good your product is, it's not going to sell itself. Um, in fact, um, B2B sales are complex. Multiple decision makers and influencers in the company have to be convinced, and it is the most expensive component, even more expensive than R&D over time uh, for a B2B software company. Um, in almost all cases, it starts with a direct sales model. Without uh, the ability to sell the product directly, there will be no channel, there will be no other um, you know, integration or other partner or reseller who's going to be able to uh, successfully sell your product. So that's a function that you have to build. Um, the ecosystem, although, however, is very important. So um, if you can partner with, say, system integrators in implementing your product or service, if they've done this four or five times, they have built up a team of people who have know-how and how to implement your product, and that team um, you know, wants to be continuously uh, kept busy. And so over time, there is an incentive on the side of the integrator to recommend uh, your product. It's not a sell-through channel, but it's a very important influencer. And the same is true for other technology partners. And it's important that you design a business model in such a way that they can make money. For example, uh, at Demandware, we had two type of partners, you know, it's, uh, the integration partners. There, it was important to make sure we sell the business, they get the implementation business, we don't try to make money off that, and they understand that. And then the technology partners, we had this link, link partner program uh, where we provided a platform for them to build add-on components and make money with it in our client base. 
in terms of you know, how to think about uh, what, what's the sales rep um, going to sell. Um, in, in, in a cloud business, um, you have to have sales reps that sell between one and two million in um, annual recurring revenue, um, at least on average across uh, you know, the, the, your, your sales force. Um, and uh, the cost of all this, because it's not going to be just the uh, key account manager, it's also going to be pre-sales, it's uh, tailor sales and so forth, um, must be um, integrated in your um, sort of uh, customer acquisition cost, customer lifetime value calculations. Really important because sales is the most expensive component. Now, let me talk about team a little bit. Um, it's often said that VCs invest in the founder, but that's not true. With VCs nowadays, um, they invest in the um, team. They invest in a group of four or five people who can build this business. If the founder, I mean, one of the key qualifications for a founder is the ability to bring together a team, even if that team cannot be you know, paid for yet, and even if they're not on full salaries yet. So um, uh, they really invest in the ability of that team to uh, build a great business and not necessarily in um, uh, the concepts and the ideas and the technologies. Because the concepts and the ideas, they could be wrong, they may need to be adjusted, and great teams are able to pivot uh, and change their strategy, and uh, they can figure it out. So your job as a founder in a B2B software company is to create a team, even if at the beginning you cannot afford to pay them salaries. Now let's talk a little bit about um, fundraising. Now fundraising is, um, a comp is, is probably the most talked about uh, component of building uh, software companies, in particular B2B software companies. And there is a huge difference, a huge, huge regional difference. Obviously, the place with the highest valuation and the most money to spend remains the Silicon Valley. Um, however, the hurdle and the sophistication that you have to uh, provide uh, to a VC in the, in the Silicon Valley is much higher than it is here. So, you know, it's a little lower, uh, the, both the valuations and the sophistication on the East Coast. And, uh, you know, in Germany, you know, there are you know, places like uh, uh, Berlin and, you know, to some degree also Munich and Hamburg uh, where it's possible to raise money, but um, not as much, and the investors don't tend to be as sophisticated. Um, how to think about fundraising. I mean, first, you want to understand what's the core market where we have to win in order to get to sort of in a global leadership position. If that's the US, then you have to basically find a way to fundraise in the US. Because if you don't, someone there, another entrepreneur, will build a company, and that company will have access to much more funding than you have, and you'll lose. So uh, to really coldly think about where do I need to be to win, and where, where do I need to uh, fundraise from whom is super important. Now, how to fundraise if you don't know the area, if you don't have a big network? Basically, you build a network. You go, and what we did, for example, at uh, Demandware in Boston. I didn't have a network in Boston in 2004. Um, I would, with a small team of my co-founders, we would go and meet VCs, basically tell them we are not here to raise money, we just want to get some feedback on our concept. And do you know anyone else who might be interested and so forth? And through this, we networked quickly. Um, we also, we not only met, uh, met uh, VCs, we also met uh, you know, prospective customers, employees, and so forth. And after two months, we basically had a term sheet, a bunch of other interested investors, an extended team that we could tap into as soon as we had the money. And um, I would think that the same mechanism uh, should work in any place, um, you yeah. know, could be Boston, could be New York, could be uh, Silicon Valley, and to some degree also works um, in Germany. All right, so we have a couple minutes left, and what I want to do with this is show you a practical example for a B2B startup, my new company, New Store. Now, here's what happened. In 2014, um, I saw uh, the traffic pattern, pattern in, on e-commerce uh, sites sh shifting towards mobile rapidly. At the beginning of the year of 2014, it was something like 10% mobile. At the end, it was you know, more than 50. More interestingly, it wasn't uh, as much uh, tablet traffic as we thought, so the tablet traffic sh share declined. Nowadays, I, we can clearly see that um, you know, e-commerce is becoming a smartphone-only business. 
Web browsers as we know them are not going to be the primary shopping uh, user interface for um, e-commerce. And apps are superior to browsers. And uh, so I think in two years or three years, nobody will shop from a web browser, but everybody is using um, you know, a branded app from that particular brand on a smartphone. Now, um, obviously, smartphones don't work well with a browser. It's hard to fill out a form with a shipping address, billing address, and so forth. So there, today, uh, smartphones convert are not as good as web browsers, and companies lose money. So it's a clear pain here. Um, and you know, consumers nowadays, because they have a mobile device, they expect to be serviced digitally, not just um, you know, uh, when they are outside of a store, but also inside of a store of that brand. And there, the sales associates basically operate in an analog world. They use a POS catch register. Only few brands have something like apps. And then, obviously, Amazon is a threat to every brand and because they hold uh, the monopoly uh, on convenience. Now, what to do about it? We have an idea. For Carrie, a night out starts with a day of shopping. On the hunt for a little black dress, she's armed with only a keen fashion sense and her iPhone. The first stop, Giovanna Dodici, her go-to brand. A kiosk offer welcomes Carrie to the store. By downloading Giovanna's app, she gets exclusive access to the summer collection. A text message gives her a link to the App Store. With the app installed, Samantha, a sales associate, gets an alert that Carrie is in the store. With the new store app, Samantha sees Carrie's preferences and order history. With access to the full catalog and real-time stock levels, finding the right dress doesn't take long. Samantha checks Carrie out right on the spot. Using Apple Pay, Carrie's big night is off to a fast start. While waiting for her latte, Carrie receives a recommendation from Samantha. Nice shoes. With a swipe and a tap, Carrie orders them and requests rush delivery. Samantha gets a pick, pack, and ship request from the new store app. She checks her store inventory. Ah, she's got them. The next steps are laid out by new store, so she knows exactly what to do. She prints the label, puts the shoes in a bag, and requests a driver to rush it to carry. That's how Giovanna Dodici defines customer engagement. As her shoes weave their way through midtown traffic, Carrie can get ready and track the delivery in real time. It's all coming together. Carrie sees that her driver is nearby. She hopes the night goes as smoothly as the day. The time has arrived and everything is perfect. Well, maybe not. The shoes are too tight, but nothing is going to ruin her evening. Carrie opens up the app, quickly finds her order, and requests an instant exchange. Samantha gets a ship from store request on her Apple Watch. She doesn't have the right size. So New Store automatically reroutes the order to the next best location. They have them in the Uptown store, and soon they're on their way to the restaurant. Carrie gets the good news. The driver is just a minute away. What a relief! From instant exchange to quick change. Now that's some fancy footwork. The original shoes are returned, and Carrie lets Samantha know she's a lifesaver. Carrie doesn't miss a beat, so she's happy. Samantha receives great feedback, so she's happy. The head of retail operations gets the big picture with New Store HQ, and she's happy. And Carrie's date looks pretty happy, too. New Store, the only mobile retail platform that boosts conversion, promotes engagement, unifies online and offline, and modernizes fulfillment. New Store, the mobile retail platform. So I hope you've seen nothing less but the future of retail. Yeah, so basically, practically speaking, you know, Neustor is a company headquartered in Boston. We have engineering in Berlin, which we love. Um, essentially, it's a white-label consumer app that brands can customize. There's a retail app that the store associates are using, and everything runs in the cloud. And, uh, you know, I hope it's going to be a big hit. We are certainly working on it very hard. Thank you.
All right, the future of retail. Thank you so much, Stefan. So I was reading a blog.